figure out the fin finaglings up here. Something punched me in the stomach when I came up here. <laughs> this is going to have to be changed. That's all I know. <laughs> Get that out of the way. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is either. So but apparently it holds that up here. So I'm not going to mess with it right now. Good morning, I said. Good morning. There you go. Now you're awake and now you're alive. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yeah. I am too. What a great day. It's a beautiful day in the Lord. It's a great time to celebrate. Uh, first day of the week. I mean, you just can't beat starting your day off like this. Just with God's people. God's house, worshiping the Lord together, rejoicing. God is so good to us. Well, we're celebrating that season. Here we come. Uh, you know, people call it the uh, holiday season. But in truth of the matter is, it's the holy day season. And somehow we changed it to holly instead of holy. Is that just me bouncing around up here? Can you hear that out there, Bruce? It's driving me crazy on stage, whatever it is. Thank you, ma'am. But anyway... I want to share with you a message. We finished our series on the book of Philippians. Out of that, we came in talking about lifestyle management and what we do with our finances and stewardship and responsibility over the blessings that God has given to us and he's placed in our hands. Today, we want to move into a series of messages. We're just dealing with the days and the season that we're in. We enter into Thanksgiving time and then we enter into the holiday season with a celebration of Christmas and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They really are intended to be the holy days, which somehow we've now turned them into the holy days. And uh, I think we missed the mark. But the message today, let me find this thing here, is entitled, you know, well, to go back to it. Apparently it's not working either. That's the, that's the second message there. The first message has to do with uh, putting the holy back in the holidays. And how do we put the holy back in the holidays? Well, the second title of the message was as follows. And it was that uh, kind of secondary thing of fighting fair at family festivities. Because there's certainly a time when we can make the holy days or the holidays certainly unholy or even unholy by our behavior. This is the time of the year when a lot of us are going to get together with friends and family and celebrate Thanksgiving and then on into the Christmas season. You'll be around family probably this time of year more than any other time of year. And uh, some of you have some weird families. <laughs> but some of us have some weird families. Amen. There's just something about family that... Uh, that can either just delight us or frighten us. I, I don't know what it is. But we all have families that we come out of and we're part of and God placed us in. And by the way, it was a sovereign act of God. You're in the family you're, you are in by the hand of God. You had no say so in it and you know, God put you there, all right? That's where you are. Now, the thing about families is, ultimately, if you understand biblical world vision and biblical perception and biblical philosophy, if you want to call it that. Family is really, for Christians, the training ground for life. It's where we grow up, we learn how to relate to people, we learn how to relate to one another, we learn how to relate to authority. It's the place where we, it's, it's the training, ultimately, for life. Because everything we do in life is about relationships. We're always involved in relationships. It's relationships at work, relationships even in, 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 the, in the grocery store, everywhere you go, you're in interrelating with people and situations. The place that we learn about proper relationships, how do we relate to people and how do we mature in life in those relationships? It should be learned in our homes and it should be learned in our families. But unfortunately, so many families have not gotten this down yet. They don't understand the concept. Many people weren't raised in families where those things were important, where they're vital and necessary. Most families are very, as the popular terminology is, is dysfunctional. And, and are torn apart and have problems and issues. And therefore we bring up children with problems and issues because they're raised by parents with problems and issues that they never resolved in their life. And on and on and on it goes. Uh, the real meat of life is, going, is supposed to be learned in your home. All right, that's where it, we're supposed to honor and learn how to honor Christ and learn how to honor people and learn how to honor one another. And what we learn in our families is then translated as we get out into the real world and into life. But again, it gets back to the problem. So many people did not learn the life lessons that they were intended to learn in their families. So now they're struggling out in the world that they live in. So this message today is, I believe, will help you in the long run. And maybe you're that kind of person. Maybe you're the one who thinks you put fun in dysfunctional. I don't know. <laughs> but maybe, maybe you're that individual in your home, you know, that just uh, what it might be that you don't see it, but everybody else does. All right, let me let you know about that. 
but you're that person or maybe you live in a family and you know, you love getting together with family, but maybe there's just one person or two people whenever they show up for a family event, you know, it's just something, you know, the hair on the back of your neck begins to cockle up a little bit, you know, and you're just, you know, you just think, oh, I just hope they don't do something or say something or whatever it might be. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about yet? Yes. How, how many of you can relate with that? Okay. All right. And don't tell me if they're sitting with you or not. Okay. Or don't raise your hand if, if you're, you're that person particularly, amen. But so I want to talk about is, you know, how do, how do we get it back into where the, our gatherings are not something we would dread or would be terrified of or, you know, be thinking, I just don't know if I want to do this this year, put up with that again. And, you know, what if so-and-so shows up? Hey, we are in Christ as children of God. And I want you to know as children of God in Christ, we're free. And we're free to be who God's called us to be. And we're free to relate to other people the way God's called us to relate. And the holidays should be a great time of ministry and a great time of blessing and a great time for you to just exemplify the grace and the glory of God in your life. If you miss that, then, you know, that's usually end up at the, fair, the, the fighting at the family festivities. And that's not the way God intended it. I'm going to give you about six or seven things today, I think, that will help you. They've helped me in my life. And not only will they help you in your, your, your family uh, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins, whatever. They'll help you here in your church. These principles will help you where you work in your life, help you in your marriage. I mean, just these are basic biblical principles about what it means to, to be what God's called us to be. And let me put that in a simple word, to be holy. All right? God's called us to be holy even as I'm holy. And guess what? When I'm holy and I'm celebrating the holidays, guess what? I'm putting the holy back in the holidays. Amen? Amen? So as we look at these today, take note. See what God has to say to you. And then not only do that, apply these simple principles in your walk and in your life and especially at any family gatherings you've got coming up and then get back to me and tell me how that went. See how it's different. See what God can do in this situation. Amen. First of all is this. Before you approach it, you need to forgive your family of all past offenses. Period. Say, I knew this was going to be hard. <laughs> you need to forgive them. It's pretty simple. The Bible says, even as Christ has forgiven you. All right. So for the sake of Christ, for the glory of God, I choose at this point, if I've been offended by somebody to forgive them. It, and it's, it's an issue that we could talk about for the whole length of time that we have here together today. But let me say it is an important issue in your life. You learn to forgive. That's the way you're going to get through life. That's the way you're going to navigate life successfully. If you cannot forgive those who've offended you, and who offends us more than anybody else? It's usually those that are closest to us, right? I mean, if you call me a slob, it doesn't hurt my feelings. When Kathy calls me a slob, you know, I, I take it to heart. <laughs> All right? Because it's the people we love the most. They're the ones who have the, the capacity to hurt us the most. So we enter into this relationship to say, hey, you know, no matter what, whatever's gone on in the past, whatever's gone on before this moment in my life, I'm going to, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive them. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Colossians and to the church there in chapter three. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What's that mean? Just in the same way, the same fashion, the same manner that Jesus forgave you, you forgive others. Yes. Well, how'd that happen? Well, let me tell you first and foremost, it happened long before you were born long before your offenses even began. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners in Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And by the way, that's you and me, the ungodly. Christ died, even while we were, even when we began to understand about Christ, we still maintained our own way. We still fought God. We still resisted. We still did our own thing. We still turned our own way and went our own direction. And it wasn't until some climactic moment in our life of realization and revelation that we surrender our hearts to Christ and we realize that he loved me, he forgave me a long time ago. I just need to receive this gift. Well, what you need to do is to give a gift of forgiveness this, this season where you just extend grace and forgive. You don't know what they did. Maybe you need to take into account everything you've been and everything you've done in life against the Lord himself. All right. Just, just take it all in account and then realize that Christ forgave you long before you even asked for forgiveness. So it's not a matter of me forgiving them based on the fact that they come to me and ask for forgiveness. They may never, but I will forgive them. I will forbear them. I will forgive them. If I have a quarrel against them, I'm going to forgive them. 
for the sake and for the glory of Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, that one may seem difficult. Let me give you one a little bit more difficult. You with me still? Ask for forgiveness of your past offenses. Somebody shows up at that event, that family event, and God brings to your heart something where you offended them, where you hurt them, where you said something to them, where you did something, and it ultimately offended and hurt and affected their life, then it's time to ask them to forgive you. It's time, to, it's time to man up, woman up, whatever the case may be, you know, and do what you need to. You say, well, I was justified because they did something. There's no justification. You say, well, I've got plenty of reason. When we get saved and we come to Christ, we now have this command from the Lord that we forgive others, just like we've been forgiven. So that now means that I have a responsibility to forgive. I don't care what I may claim as a right. I need to give those up. That's the old life. That's the old man. That's the old world. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. So now I'm going to choose to live in the new life. I'm going to forgive. And then if I've offended, I need to, I, I need to ask them to forgive me. You know, and you say, well, you know, Brother Joe, you know, that was a long time ago. I was a kid. Doesn't matter. I can tell you they remember it. Yes. Especially if you remember it, they remember it. And they may downplay it. They may, it doesn't matter. They may think, you know, they may all oh, just, just say, I need to deal with this. For the sake of Christ, I hurt you. I offended you. You know, I just, I just need to apologize. You don't go say, well, can I tell you something in love? I hate your guts. That doesn't work. <laughs> That's not going to fly. You go and you deal with it. And what happens? Freedom begins to happen. Is it Matthew 5 where he says, you know, if you have a gift, leave it at the altar. And you realize why you're at the altar, because that's usually where we have revelation. And when we get to the altar and start de doing business with God, God begins to put stuff on our heart. He says, at that point, when you, were, you see that you've offended somebody, you go get it. If you have a brother and you, there's things aren't right between you and them, then you go get it right with them. And then your gift will be received by the Lord. You just leave it there. God will take care of it when it's time to take care of it. You have stuff to take care of first. At the altar, when you remember, it's usually at the altar where God speaks to my heart and reminds me of some issue in my life that needs to be taken care of. Oh, I was just a teenager. Teenagers do stupid things. You could well do, and I've more than once apologized to my mama for my behavior as a teenager and after a teenager, you know, for the way I treated her, for the disrespect that I showed, for the selfishness that I demonstrated. Amen. I mean, who can be more selfish than teenagers? Amen, teenagers? Yeah, don't shake your head at me. You know I'm telling the truth. I want, give me, you owe me, I want everybody, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into that little scenario. And you need to realize how selfish that is. And you say, you know, I've been selfish. I'm sorry. You know, I was at the altar. The Lord spoke to me. I heard a word from the Lord. I need to resolve this. You say, well, who can be, uh, children. I mean, children can be the meanest things in the world, can't they? I had, listen, I had a bunch around me growing up. There were six of us. Meanest people in the world. Some are sitting here on the front row. They're going to, amen, amen. <laughs> Partial, mean-spirited, you know. I won't even begin to tell you. Yeah. Maybe we all just sit out at Thanksgiving and just have a little confession time, amen. <laughs> <laughs> just, just get it out, you know, take care of it, get it out. Because, you know, somebody was probably hurt down the road. Somebody's been affected for their whole life by that event, perhaps. It's time just to say, hey, you know, that was stupid on my part. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was young. That's not an excuse. That was foolishness. Forgive me. It's amazing what, what the Lord will do. Now, those two right there alone can start a revival in your life, even in your home. But let me give you something that's real key to this, and, and, and to making this happen. This is simple. Just be praying. Be praying even. You ought to do this every day anyway, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The key to relationships, the key to rec reconciliation is always the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. And working through us. The Bible says God gives us a ministry of reconciliation. Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Pastor Strickland just did a Wednesday night series on the fruit of the Spirit. All right? In other words, if I'm being filled with the Spirit, the character of the Spirit will flow out of me. That's the character of Jesus. It's the life of Jesus. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's long-suffering. Say, what's that mean? Long-suffering. But God gives you the capacity to suffer long with gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness, which is that, you know, I have authority, but I, it's under control. I could do something, but I am in control here because God gives me that power. Temperance is, is, is self-control. Against these things, there is no law. 
It's really, it's just the byproduct of living the Christian life is the Holy Spirit working through my life. I can have, I can have the power of God resting on my life. And out of that comes, listen to me, truly meaningful family, personal relationships. That flows out of a spirit-filled life. So pray. When you go into events, pray. When you get up in the morning, pray. Lord, fill me with your spirit today. It doesn't say feel, F-E-E-L, you know, I want to feel something. He says fill, F-I-L-L. It has to do with control. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit rule my life today. Let him control. And, but as he does, he gives me the strength, the courage, the joy, the peace, all that's needed. You know, I believe what our families need to see and we need to demonstrate more than anything else. It's not some hyper-religious attitude, but just the reality of the love of God that flows through our life and is manifest. And, and that makes a difference in their lives. Romans 2 says, do you despise the riches of God's goodness and his forbearance and his long suffering? Don't you know it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? In other words, because God is gracious, because God is patient, because God is forbearing. I saw that mercy and grace in Christ Jesus and it drew me to repentance. Listen, the best place for people to see that is in you and through you as you demonstrate gentleness and forbearance and grace and mercy with others. It's to be demonstrated in your life. Ephesians 4 says, with all lowliness, apparently it missed a slide there, didn't it? Yeah, there used to be one there. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Simple passage of scripture. What do we do? It's an attitude of lowliness, a spirit of meekness. Hey, all these emotions that I might go through, they're in check because the Holy Spirit lives in my life. So I can demonstrate forbearance. I can demonstrate long suffering. Colossians puts it this way. Chapter three, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy and kindness and humbleness and my, uh, mind and meekness and gentleness. So all that has to do with this, this fourth point is this. i get to it here. Is you have to be willing to be a living sacrifice. Be willing to be a living sacrifice. That means just today, and, and this is our life every day. It's not some family gathering, but it's every day, but especially in these moments where we can make an impact in our own families. These are the people we love the most. These are the people we want to see in heaven. These are the people we want to see God do something in their lives. So this is the time I say, hey, Lord, I'm willing to be the living sacrifice here. According to Romans 12, it says, present my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. In doing that, this is when I choose to demonstrate lowliness and kindness and, and the meekness. It's all part of this same thing that says, hey, I'm willing to lay down my life. Galatians 2 says, I'm crucified with Christ. I love this passage in Isaiah. We quote it often. You know, in Isaiah, go back to that and let me run it, okay? <laughs> in Isaiah, he makes the point about how Christ has suffered on our behalf. What Jesus has done for us is by his stripes, by his wounds. It's by the grace of God. I mean, when you gave your life to Christ, let's just go back for a moment. I don't know about you, but in my, my life, the thing that drew me to Christ was one, the Holy Spirit made me real aware of how lost I was and how much I needed Jesus, right? I mean, that's part of, that's that work of conviction. The Bible says, you know, the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. So anybody that comes to Christ to be found in his mercy and grace first has to realize they're lost, all right? So I'm lost without Christ. So I come to Christ and I realize my lostness. Is there any hope? And I come to God's, and you know what I see when I come to God? I see Christ on the cross dying for my sins. I see Christ without stress. Arms. I see Christ taking that beating. I see Christ Jesus with the crown of thorns upon his head. And it humbles me and it draws me to him. I mean, just singing songs about the blood or the cross or just something that tugs and pulls at our heart when we begin to think about the sacrifice of Jesus for me. Powerful, moving, supernatural as I think about what God's done for me. Now, he became a sacrifice for our sins, did he not? Now, the Bible tells us that we now become a living sacrifice for Christ as well. I believe that when we in the gentle spirit of Jesus, surrendering our heart and our will, our mind, our emotions to the Lord Jesus, our mouth to the Lord Jesus, when we do that, I believe that something supernatural is happening. Eyes can't hold it, all right? because it's happening in the hearts of people, but God is drawing people to him through our lives, through our willingness to surrender ourselves and to be a willing sacrifice. I believe God's doing something in our families that can't be preached into them, that can't, you can't beat it into the Bible. This is something that's demonstrated through 
the reality of your changed life. People see Christ in you. And there's nothing more appealing than Jesus in all the world. He is beautiful Savior. And it is him who draws people. So we, draw, we, we come close to him. And in doing that, guess what happens? People begin to see the Lord Jesus Christ in us. Back to Ephesians. It's with lowliness, with meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. That's where, that's where it comes into being that gentle lamb. That's where it comes in. Knowing you're a lion in your heart, you still demonstrate the lamb suffering likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we put up with people. We forbear them. And we do it with an attitude of acceptance. And we do it with an attitude of grace. And we do it with an attitude of love. When that is the last thing we want to do in our flesh, is it not? Because I don't know about you, my superiority complex wants to put them in their place. Who do you think you are? Quit acting like an idiot. <laughs> Instead of waiting for the Lord to speak, that's why the Bible tells us in Colossians that we put on God's holy and beloved bowels of mercy and compassion. Philippians puts it this way in the Phillips translation. Have a reputation for gentleness and never forget the nearness of our Lord. Because sometimes that's not been our reputation, has it? Can I now embrace this whole new concept of just surrendered hearts and life to Jesus Christ? And can I now say this has to apply more than anywhere else in my family? I can't demonstrate it in the pulpit. I can't demonstrate it in the office. I need to demonstrate with my, in my house and in my home and with the people I care about and the people I love. That I'll, I'll take on this, this attitude of gentleness. And here, here's the way you say, how do you do that? The second part of that, Jesus is near. Amen. Don't forget the nearness of Jesus. He's there. As you gather around Thanksgiving or Easter celebrations or Christmas celebrations and families gather there, there's another unseen member of the family there that you're a part of. And that is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is near. You can't tell him, would you go back to the bathroom while I act like an idiot? <laughs> would you please go to the master bedroom? I'm going to put somebody in their place. You can't do that. There's no Jesus manifest in your life of that, with, that, with, with that kind of heart and that kind of attitude. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, he says, Oh, man of God, flee those things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. There they are again. The problem, I think, too often, we want to be served. We don't want to be the servant. And we approach it like that. Well, here I am. God's gift to this family. Well, let's leave it unopened, perhaps. <laughs> and we forget that we're there to be a servant. We're there to be a reconciler. We're there to be a minister of the grace of God. Now, number five will keep you, it will keep you in the right place, all right? Now, I put it in very clear terms like this. Be a listener, all right? Don't get caught up in senseless, useless, gossipy chatter and all that kind of stuff. You know, learn how to respond, not react when people do say stupid stuff. Let me put it, let me put it in the, the Joe Arms translation. I put be a listener because it sounded so much sweeter than what I wanted to write up there. <laughs> just shut up. <laughs> Simple word, just shut up. If we can just learn to shut up, the Bible said we can control our mouth, we can control our whole body. Amen? Say, I need to lose 40 pounds. Shut up. You can't put anything in a closed mouth. Amen? I mean, he says you can control the whole, whole body just like a, 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 a little rudder on a boat controls the direction of it. Your tongue controls the direction of your life. And if we could just learn to, 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 to be careful about speaking in and of itself, that would change everything in the world around us. Just learn to be a listener. You say, but what happens when they accuse me of something? I need to defend myself. No, you don't. Let the Lord be your defender. I, I, I've written down 18 quick little things here. It's just little, little statements. And they're based up from, from 1 Peter 3, 18, of what to do when you're, when you're slandered, all right? In 1 Peter 3, he says, finally, be ye all of one mind. How do you do that? Have compassion one for another. Well, that's not going to go down the list. Love is brethren. Be compassionate. Be courteous. Don't render evil for evil. Don't give an insult when you're insulted. That's the hardest part right there, isn't it? Because sometimes, you know, I, growing up again, I get with six kids, uh, you know, the tongue gets real sharp. It's sharpened daily. We learn how to respond, put each other in place, declare our rights, demand our way, you know. And you, you know, you, if you grew up with even two kids in that, you know what I'm talking about. 
You can't, you can't transfer that to your adult life. You can't transfer that to Christian life. Something begins to change when the salt of God's grace comes in your life. Now you begin to speak with your word seasoned with salt. And it's now there's no longer this, he says, don't covet, don't desire what's theirs, have pity, be courteous, don't render evil for evil, don't render accusation for accusation. He said, but instead of all that, if you're going to speak, give a blessing. He said, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from God. He goes on to say, here's what you do, eschew or hate evil. Do good, seek peace and ensue it. Follow that which is good. And if you suffer, be happy for it. Why? Because you're suffering with the right heart and righteousness and God will exalt that. Don't be afraid when you're troubled. Don't, he said, and sanctify Jesus as Lord in your heart. In other words, make sure you surrender to the Lordship of Christ. He says, keep your conscience clear. In this whole context of people speaking is what's going on here. Accusations and slander and words are going on. Just keep your heart clean and keep your mind clean and keep your conscience clear. And don't be afraid to suffer for doing what's right. Why are we so afraid of that? What's that mean? That means I'm willing to become to the cross. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Well, Joe, that's hard to do. Absolutely. But that's where the grace of God comes in. Keep your mouth shut. But you can speak. I love what Mickey Bonner put it like this. Speak when you're spoken through. And how do you know? Well, there's a blessing. There's encouragement. There's the courtesy. There's, you know, and it goes on this whole list of things you can do in here of sharing love for love, be compassionate, be united, you know, follow what's good, you know, don't be afraid. It, there's so many positive things here. You say, how do you know if God's communicating through you? Well, Ephesians says, don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. How do I know it's good? It's going to minister grace to the person that hears it. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, is what he goes on to say. You've been sealed unto the day of redemption. So let the bitterness and the wrath and the malice and the anger and the clamor and the evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. It's a pretty powerful word, is it not? So what can I do? He tells you there's plenty you can do. Do that, which will give a blessing. In fact, who is the person in your family that's going to be at the events this season? who just is the weird one, besides me. I mean, they're just, just strange. I mean, and maybe it's because they're, maybe because a lot of people in your family are believers and they're not yet. Or if they are, they're real backslidden. You know, so you kind of have them off to a little bit of a side because, you know, you know, I don't know what they've been smoking, but it's stuff that's weird. <laughs> you know? Go to that one. Start there. Start with the hurting. That's where Jesus always started with. Right. He's sick that need a physician. And guess what? Who's the doctor? You are. Just live Jesus in front of him. See what God does. But watch your mouth. Careful what you say. Ecclesiastes puts it this way. Again, I, I'm, he says here, the words of a wise man are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow him up. He'll swallow himself up. Beginning of words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of talk is mischievous madness. A fool is also full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? But man, ask me, I usually can tell you when I'm being foolish. It's easy just to be full of words. Yeah, yeah it's fun to have fun and to talk, but we should be careful about what we talk, what we say. We're measured, we're, we're careful to make sure that what we do is gonna make a difference in somebody's life for the glory of God. Proverbs 15, one says, a soft answer turns away wrath but grievous words stir up anger. It's amazing if people start raising their voice, even getting to an agitated state with somebody. It's amazing just a soft word will do. It says it turns away. Proverbs 25 says, by a long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaks the bone. That's a pretty powerful verse. By a long persuasion. No, by a soft answer. A prince is persuaded. Number seven, and this is obviously the, all this ties into this is prayer. Ephesians talks about how that we're in a spiritual battle. One thing we need to understand about the spiritual battle that we're in is that, listen carefully, God loves you and God loves your family and God wants to use you and your family. All right? Let's think about it. God loves you and God loves your family and God wants to use you and your family. God ordained the family. God sanctified the family. It is of God. It's under assault in the culture that we live in. It's under constant assault the sanctity of marriage, the home and family, the unit of family. 
I mean, everything in our culture seems to be just set on destroying that sanctity of a home. But understand, God loves you. God loves your family. And God wants to use you and your family. So how do I do that? Well, I need, I need God's grace. I need to understand as much as God loves me, God loves my family, and God wants to use me and my family, Satan hates me, and Satan hates my family, and he wants to destroy it, and he'll use me if I let him. You with me? Yeah. And usually he can use me by what I say, my actions, my attitudes. Be cautious. Don't be a fool. He said, be a wise man. The best thing we can do, and this is for our families every day, is to pray. Pray for your family. Pray for those family members who don't know Jesus Christ. Pray for those family members who are straying from the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for those family members who are serving Jesus Christ. You pray for one another. You bind the enemy. We have this unique authority as the children of God to rebuke Satan. And I, I believe, especially in the context of our own families. I mean, that's where God placed us. That's where we're supposed to be reigning over the enemy and surrender to his will in our lives. And so we're reigning with Christ. And so in those positions, especially, it's one thing for me to rebuke the enemy that may be attacking my family, my wife, my children. You know, and you may pray for my family, my wife, my children. But it's another thing when you pray for your family, your wife, children. There's a unique place that you have in your family as a priest unto the Lord. You exercise that authority and you do it not just praying for them, but in standing God with God in agreeing for his will for their lives. You take authority over every force of hell that's moving against your family. Ask God to do something supernatural. And, and, and this is the last one. Believe God for a miracle. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Let's relate that to our family. What am I not believing? You gotta refrain from this, 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 this mindset that says, Oh, he never will. She never will. I know they've heard of I don't think they're ever going to get right. They're, they're not, you know, it's just, I, you know, we're not, God, God just knows, you know, maybe they're not the elect. <laughs> That's not my business. My business is to pray for them. My business is to believe God for them. My, you know, I'm just, I'm just silly enough to, to believe what Romans says when Paul's talking to the Philippian jailer and he says, hey, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved in your whole family. Or it's your salvation can result in the salvation of your family. So that's what I'm going to hold on to, amen? I'm going to hold on to the promise that has me believe in God to do something supernatural in my family. Now, my mama is here today, and she's had some terrible children in her life. <laughs> Rebels down the line. But in believing God, just look back over the years. You see, one comes, another comes, then another comes. Maybe a long time, but here, here comes another. And then a long, long time ago, it's not when nobody thought would come. There he comes. <laughs> and he comes. Don't give up. That's right. You keep praying. Get rid of any thought in your mind. You say, well, it'll just never because this, hey, that's junk right out of hell. When you pray, you pray expecting. You pray with anticipation. You pray trusting because sooner or later, bless God, if God allows you to live long enough, you'll see it. If not, you'll see it in heaven. There you go. Amen. Amen. God's a big God. We need to give him the room to work. We, we interfere with him working with our unbelief. Look forward to that moment and that time with joy, with expectation. Put your expectations in the Lord over it. You know, Sometimes healing takes a long time, but God is sovereign and he has a way of manipulating the circumstances so that ultimately people's eyes will be opened. Who knows what it'll take? Who knows what's gonna to have to happen? You have to be willing to suffer through it, press on through it, and believe God for his miracle. I believe God works. I believe God's fully still alive. I do not believe that time ticking off on the clock or the calendar has hindered the power, the ability, the sovereignty, the supernatural ability of the Holy Spirit to work in anybody's life. I believe God's still on the throne. I do believe that God still is the same as he's always been yesterday, today, and forever. I do believe that what God intends is his will will be fulfilled. And we're going to pray with him and we're going to believe him and we're going to trust him. We're not going to cower down. We're not going to act ridiculous. We're not going to revert to our old ways. We're going to let the people that we love, we care about, we know, see us in Jesus Christ. And when we fail in those moments and act like the foolish person that Proverbs talks about, we apologize. That was stupid of me. That was stupid of me. Nobody knows any more than me in this world 
God, this is not a poor me moment, it's just a fact. Then what it is like to be held in a different frame than the rest of the world. When you take on the name pastor, evangelist, preacher, it's a different world for you. You're under constant scoping. All right? Constant look. Well, let's see what he does. Let's see what he said. Well, you think you're a preacher. Look how he did. Look how he acted. All right? When you declare yourself to be a Christian, in many ways, it's the same thing. And your family, when, they, when, you, when you fail in front of them, recognize it. I love Jesus. It's a journey. I'm still, I'm still moving forward. It's, it's a journey. I'm just a man. You're just a woman. You know? And hey, listen, I don't know who said it, but said, hey, man, at his very best, is still just a man. <laughs> all right? James said, we all stumble in many ways. Recognize that when you do falter and you say something stupid, be, be man enough, woman enough to back up and say, hey, that was dumb, I'm sorry. Now, the last thing you need to do is embrace what I call the stupid principle. The stupid principle is to tell your family, well, you know me, that's just my personality. That's all right if you're a lost person. That's cool. I can live with that. I, I can tolerate all day long lost people. They're stupid, they act stupid. You know what I mean? In that context. If you're lost, you just do stuff to make any sense. There's this insanity to sin. <laughs> you know, it comes right along with it. I'm never surprised by what people do that don't know Jesus. I'm telling them what they'll do because we're all capable of that. But when we, get, when we become Christians, you can't, you can't use that shabby excuse anymore. Well, that's just the way I am. That's just my personality. And here's the one that me, ticks me off more than that one. You know, if you want to get upset about them, that's my spiritual gift. It just has to do that because I'm, I'm this way. I'm, that's my spirit. No, 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 that doesn't fly either. Your spiritual gift makes you more like Jesus, not less like him. Well, I'm a prophet, so I can be mean, spirit, and rude with everybody. No, you can't. That's not a prophet. That's a backslider. You don't see a prophet in action. You see a man who gets on his face when people reviled him, gets on his face, goes, gets God's face, and seeks him like Isaiah and Moses and those guys. They don't forgot with God. Prayed, sought God's face. Amen? Amen. On the other hand, you can't, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just shy, so I really can't stand up and shine for Jesus. That's a lie, too. Be what God's called you to be. Live what God's called you to live. And I believe that we can, if we choose to be holy, we put the holy back in the holy days, in the holidays. Would you stand with your heads bowed?